Pastor Jay Mansbridge here, lead pastors of Bayside Church International, based here on the south coast of South Australia. Our great passion as a church is to help people to know Jesus and to demonstrate His love, truth and life in everything that we do. We hope you enjoyed today's message. Well, a very big welcome to you again to what we here at Bayside Church have decided to call, among other things, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, but we've decided to call it our Sneak Peak Sunday. This is the very first time that we've ever live streamed a service to the public. For the last three or four weeks, we've been doing this in-house on an internal Facebook group that we've been have, uh, had, worked out some technical issues uh, as we've gone. In fact, for the first couple of Sundays, uh, when this whole thing kicked in uh, a month ago, uh, I was in isolated quarantine. I was speaking at a conference uh, to our friends in New Zealand, with our friends in New Zealand, and got back on exactly the same day that the Prime Minister introduced his uh, quarantine rules for overseas travellers. So for the first couple of weeks and Sundays here at churches, churches were asked to shut down in groups of uh, groups of hundreds, uh, I think it was, first of all, and then four square metre all, then groups of ten, you know the whole routine. Uh, we were doing in-house streaming. But today, a very first time that we've uh, opened this out to the public, and, but really, uh, we want to invite you to come into our four walls, and what a great way to be able to do that today from the comfort of your own home. Truth be told, we are the type of church that does have visitors with us almost every single week. In fact, this weekend, of course, being here in Victor Harbour on the Flurio, uh, we typically have well over 200 people here in this auditorium, many holiday makers that have come. And uh, as you've seen in the last couple of days, those of you who live locally, it seems that our holiday makers have taken uh, the encouragement from our government and others very seriously in not visiting us this weekend. So certainly hope that, that bodes well for our community. But here's the thing, while many businesses are uh, unfortunately, regrettably closed down at the moment, and while churches, in a sense, are closed down to the public in a physical way, the good news today is this. Heaven is still very much open for business. And as far as heaven is concerned, it is business as usual, and we have a great opportunity today on Resurrection Sunday to sit back and to reflect on those things which are most important. As the sun rises or as the globe turns this morning, multiplied millions of people across the world are going to be enjoying a church gatherings as we are doing in this way. And so once more, we're really, really glad that you've come to take a look behind the curtain, to have a look through the window, as it were, this morning for Sneak Peek Sunday. So if you've never been to church before, especially for you, for our local community here on the Flurio, a very, very big welcome to you. And this morning, I actually want to play on that word a little bit, the whole image there of an open curtain. And I want to talk to you about three things that are key to the Easter story. I want to speak to you this morning about an open curtain. Secondly, I want to speak about an open tomb. And then we're going to finish third, talking about an open door, an open curtain an open tomb and an open door. And if we had a congregation here this morning uh, with people in our church, you would hear a great groan from our congregation because they know, Chad, I'm just a three-point preacher. That's what I do, okay? But if you've never been to church before, what we do now is uh, I'm going to read some scripture. I'm going to tell you uh, something of the Easter story. Uh, there are four books in our Bible that talk about the life of Jesus. He's 33 years leading up to his death and resurrection. We call them Gospels. It simply means good news. And they are called Matthew. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. You've probably heard that phrase before. They're named after the people who wrote them. And one of the good things about having four different accounts is that each author brings up their own specific angle on the story. And so each of the four accounts give a unique look into the story of Easter. And this morning I've decided to take our readings from the Gospel of Luke. As far as I'm concerned, and this is purely a personal choice, if you are new to the Bible, if you've never picked up a Bible yourself or are unfamiliar with it, the the Gospel of Luke, in my opinion, is a great place to start. It begins with the Christmas story, things you'll be familiar with, and of course ends here with the Easter story. So I'm going to be reading from Luke chapter 23. Some of you who are Christians today, part of our church, uh, possibly you're watching at home, you have your own Bible, by all means open that. Uh, for the rest of you, we're going to do our best to have the verses on the screen as I read this morning. This comes from Luke chapter 23. Two others, two other men, both criminals were led out to be executed with Jesus. When they came to a place called the Skull, 
They nailed him to the cross. And the criminals were also crucified. One was on his right and the other was on his left. This place called the Skull, it's kind of a cool name. Uh, there was a number of languages uh, in the Gospel story. Uh, the, uh, many of the Jewish people at the time spoke a language called Aramaic. The word they used was Golgotha. Okay? The Roman people, who were the political power at the time, the Latin word, the language they spoke, uh, was Calvary. So you may be familiar with those terms, but basically it means the place of the skull. And uh, while it has a uh, uh, kind of grotesque type of image there, it's actually this wonderful picture, prophetic picture and fulfillment that the scriptures speak about all the way back in the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, these ancient stories written uh, about three and a half thousand years ago, okay, one of the very first stories in there is Adam and Eve and of course the story of the serpent in the Garden of Eden, I'm sure you're familiar with that, well after the serpent's temptation, God comes to Eve and he says to her, listen, the seed, well, actually he says this to the serpent, he says the seed of the woman will crush your skull will crush your skull. The seed of the woman, now, you know, I don't need to give a sex ed lesson here today, okay, but in sex ed, we know women don't have seed, okay, they have eggs. But what God is prophesying here in the book of Genesis, three and a half thousand years ago, is He's saying there will be a woman, a virgin woman, who will give birth to a son, okay, and the serpent will bite his heel, but with that very heel, that man will crush the serpent's skull. Well, it is no coincidence, my friends, that many hundreds of years later, Jesus is crucified on a mountain called the skull. And that is one of the significant things there. That's for free. Let's keep reading. Verse 36. It said, Jesus said, while he's there on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, because they don't know what they're doing. The soldiers gambled for his clothes, throwing dice. The crowd watched, and the leaders scoffed. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he really is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers mocked him too by offering him a drink of sour wine. They called out to him, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. In fact, a sign was fastened to the cross above him with these words, this is the king of the Jews. Just another freebie, bit of a side note. If you read John's account, he tells us that the sign was written in the three languages spoken of the day, Aramaic or Hebrew, uh, Latin and also Greek. And in John's Gospel it says that the words read, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, four words. And there's a bit of a theory, and well, give, it, give or take, okay? But in the Hebrew language, when you write those four words, it creates an acronym. Okay, the first letter of each word creates an acronym, and it is Y-H-V-H. Uh, Jesus, Nazareth, King, Jews, Y-H-V-H. There, as an acronym, above Jesus' head, was the name of God. It actually said Yahweh. This was the name that the Jews knew God by. And it says the religious leaders freaked out. They said, get that sign down. Pilate said, no, 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 it's going to stay. All right, so you can look that up if you like at home. Anyway, that's the sign above Jesus' head. By this time, it was noon, the middle of the day, and darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. The light from the sun was gone. And suddenly, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple, was torn down the middle. Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those very words, he breathed his last. Here we have verses that are pertinent. Uh, for those of you who participated in Good Friday services, you may have heard these read. Of course, this is looking at Jesus' death. He breathes his last, and at the moment... He does that as Jesus' body, as it were, were torn in two at the cross. At the very same time, a curtain was torn. First thing I want to speak to you today is about an open curtain and the significance of that open curtain. A couple of things here involved. The first thing is just how physically 
significant the tearing of that curtain would be. I mean, this thing was massive, okay? It's not like the black curtain behind me here that's only a few metres long, okay? This, the temple of the time, was built by Rome. It was built with Roman money. A guy called King Herod, who was appointed by uh, the Roman emperor to be king in that area. Uh, Herod the Great, you may have heard of him historically. He's the Herod that appears in the Christmas story, okay? He's the one who uh, built this magnificent temple. And it was basically on a 40-acre compound. I mean, don't think of... Any big cathedral you may have ever visited in Europe, or if you've, you know, you come to our church building, we're a shed stuck back in an industrial estate, all right? That is not what the temple was. It was a monstrosity. It was one of the great wonders of the ancient world. The thing was absolutely massive. And this curtain was huge as well. Some claim it was up to 30 meters high. The fabric was as thick as a man's hand. Apparently, it took over 300 men just to manhandle the thing, okay? This was a massive massive, massive curtain. And there, a great miracle happened as Jesus spoke those words on the cross. From top to bottom, the Gospel of Matthew says that curtain was open. And so physically, it was an incredible miracle. But theologically or spiritually speaking, there was also incredible significance to this. You see, this particular curtain was the dividing line between a place in the temple called the Most Holy Place. Essentially, the theory was, or the worship structure at the time, said that God's very intimate presence was in an inner sanctum of the temple, okay? The Holy of Holies, the the inner, inner, inner place. And only one man could go in there. And only one time of the year. And only after performing a whole bunch of rituals and rites and regulations and restrictive worship was he allowed to venture in to that most holy place to access God. They tell us that this curtain, a first century historian called Josephus tells us that it was red, it was purple, it was blue. These were the colors symbolizing heaven and earth. And it was kind of a way of saying no access. Access is denied. There is a division between earth and heaven. There is a separation between sinful humans and a holy, pure God. And that is one of the things this curtain represented. And then at that day, on Good Friday, as Jesus' body was torn open, it was this temple curtain that was torn in two. Access that had been denied was now granted. And that torn open curtain signified, well it had very physical, an incredible physical miracle, it also signified the end of ritualistic religion. It signified the end of a relationship with God that was restricted to only certain people, that involved ritual and rites and routines and regulations, that whole system of worship that God's people had undertaken for many years. At the moment Jesus said, it is finished, he breathed his last, that temple curtain was open. It declared the end of an era and the beginning of a whole new era, a beginning of an era where access to God is granted as a gift, not on the basis of the particular family line you have been brought into, not on the basis of a particular ritual, rites or routines that you need to access to qualify to access God's presence. No, the curtain, my friend, has been opened and that is one of the reasons we call it a Good Friday. All right, it wasn't particularly good for Jesus, we know that, you've seen the passion of the Christ, but it's good for us because that day, that open curtain signifies to us that access to God's presence, access to know God, the division between heaven and earth has been made open, a new and living way, the Bible goes on to say, through the open body of Jesus, a curtain was opened and we can access God's, God freely. That is one of the reasons that Easter is a very, very good thing to celebrate. We remember this weekend an open curtain. Let's keep reading. As you keep going on in the Gospel of Luke, we come to the next chapter, and it says here in chapter 24, but early on Sunday morning, early on Sunday morning, and this, of course, is after Jesus has died, has been taken 
off the cross, uh, a wealthy man, uh, is Joseph, not Jesus' dad, okay, another guy, but a wealthy man has donated the tomb to Jesus and they've laid him in there. Guards have guarded the, the temple, uh, sorry, the, the tomb door, okay, the massive stone rolled across it. Uh, there's two ways you could bury people in these days. Some people were just, who, poor people who couldn't afford it were uh, cremated, okay, I won't go into detail there, but the wealthy people had a garden tomb where they were essentially embalmed, okay, it was his whole routine. The point is, Jesus was placed in there, guards were appointed to guard it and this is what happened on Sunday morning. Very early on Sunday morning, Women went to the tomb. They took spices that they'd prepared for Jesus' body. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. They went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there, puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them, clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified. (laughs) They bowed with their faces to the ground, but the two men said, No, 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 why are you looking among the dead for someone who's alive? Ladies, he isn't here. Come on. He is risen from the dead. Can't you remember what he told you back in Galilee? That the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and then be crucified and then he would rise again on the third day. This is what Jesus told you. Don't you remember? And then they remembered. Oh, yeah, that's right. (laughs) Jesus did actually say that, didn't he? This is the day that we are celebrating today. We're not only celebrating an open curtain, but we are celebrating an open tomb. You know, this time last year on Easter Sunday, we had a full house, holiday visitors, our own folk, and I spoke a message uh, that I called the resurrection of Jesus. Good news or fake news? Fake news, okay? Fake news. Is Is the resurrection of Jesus really good? Or is it fake news? Is it just a fairy tale? Is it just a fable? And you know, when we Christians say that we believe in the resurrection, we really do. We, like, we really do. Uh, this isn't a fairy tale for us. This isn't a fable for us. This isn't equivalent to, I hope the kids aren't watching, Easter Bunny, okay, the Tooth Fairy, Father Christmas and, and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. This is a real historical fact. This is a truth, the resurrection of Jesus, his physical, biological resurrection from literal physical, biological death. This is a reality that people within weeks and then for years afterwards, right there in this same city, Jerusalem, where it happened, were willing to give their lives for. You know, Jesus wasn't the only person crucified. It wasn't a special thing for him. This was one of the ways that the Romans used to kill their harshest criminals. And for decades after Jesus' death, Christians were fed to the lions. They were burned alive. Some of them were dipped in oil, apparently, lit alive like torches so that Emperor Nero could have his garden parties lit up with lights. Christians burning to death. They were crucified upside down. By the thousands, Christians were massacred because they said, Jesus is alive. People don't do that for a fairy tale, okay? They don't do that for a fable. They don't do that for a once upon a time story. This was a literal fact. It wasn't a con. It wasn't fake news. It wasn't a fairy tale that somehow captured the imagines and nations of people. It is a literal historical fact. And that is one of the reasons why the resurrection of Jesus is good news. And it's one of the reasons that we need to take his resurrection seriously. And there's a couple of things that the empty tomb demonstrates to us that I believe is really, really significant. And the first is this. It signifies that death is not as final as it often seems. Death is not as final as it may seem. I've lived here in this community Victor Harbour, for the best part of over 30 years, I think I've just qualified to be a local in the eyes of some people. And I grew up here, went to the local primary school, I went all the way through Victor Harbour High School, and in my year 12 year, actually at the end of my year 11 year, it was 1992, I think it was, and I was standing, no, 1994, I remember standing in my bedroom here in central Victor Harbour at the end of my year 11 year, and clear as crystal, i just turned 16, I heard a voice speak to me and that voice said, Chad, this will be your last Christmas, you are going to die at age 16. 
Now, I didn't tell anyone that. We live in a country town, okay? I'm 16. You don't go around telling people you hear voices. I think we have a better understanding of things like that nowadays. But I tell you, I literally heard a voice. I shared it with one or two trusted people because I actually thought maybe that was God. I was learning in my Christian walk to hear God's voice and I literally, out of the blue, heard a voice. and Not maybe with my physical ear, but clearly in my mind saying, this will be your last Christmas. You're going to die at age 16. Well, lo and behold, six months later, uh, out here, outside Arambira, just a couple of k's from where we're meeting today, on an evening in May, I had a life-threatening uh, car accident just out here, outside Arambira. Jaws of life tore me out. Six bags of donated blood saved my life. I was helicoptered off to Flinders Hospital. And those of you who've lived here for many years understand the, the, the danger of this type of road. Well, I had a near-death experience that night, six months after hearing a voice saying that I was going to die at age 16. And that really, for me as a teenager, was a near-death experience that faced me with the confronting reality of how final death is, or at least how final death seems. I was playing football at the time, uh, senior Colts for the uh, Victor Harbour Footy Club. It was less than 12 months earlier. We, as a football team, had lost our coach to a car accident. This community knows what it's like to lose people on our roads, and I was confronted with that reality at age 16. It was a miracle I survived. In fact, my friend who was in the back seat told us in the hospital later, the first thing he remembers is seeing me lift my arms through the shattered windscreen, and he said, Chad, I heard you singing and praying. What's the point? Death, the reality of being faced with death is it seems so final. And for the last 17 years as a pastor, I've part of my job has been to come alongside people and walk them through the grief and the confronting reality of how final death seems. Sometimes I've conducted uh, funerals and helped grieving families of people who were expected to die, some people even welcoming a death, and, and for a certain age group, I'm sure you, you understand what I mean. Other times, far more tragic. I've been with families as their children have died from irrecoverable illnesses. It was only a few months ago, sat with a local family here in this area as they held their stillborn baby in their arms. There is something so confronting about the finality of death. And yet, here's the point. The good news of the open tomb is that death is not as final as it may seem. Death does not have the final word. And Jesus' resurrection shows that, number one. Number two, the thing that Jesus' resurrection and the empty tomb shows is that Jesus can be trusted and taken at his word. What's one of the things that the angels say to the women when they say, what, Jesus is alive? What are you talking about? They say, hang on, girls. He told you this was going to happen. He told you he was going to be betrayed. He told you he was going to die. He told you that he was going to rise from the dead. And guess what? Jesus is proven right. Because when Jesus speaks, you should take his word seriously. He's actually a true prophet. All right, He is to be taken seriously. Jesus can be taken at his word. One of the things that the resurrection shows us, friends, is that Jesus can be trusted and taken at his word. When he predicted in his life that the temple, uh, the curtain that was torn, he predicted uh, within 40 years of his life that that whole thing would be destroyed. It was a ridiculous thing to prophesy, and yet history shows us it happened just as Jesus said. Jesus, time and time again, can be taken at his word, which means we need to take his words seriously. We need to take his words seriously. There was a famous author, some of you may have heard of him, C.S. Lewis. He wrote the Narnia series, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, that type of thing. And he said, listen, when you consider the words of Jesus and how audacious some of the claims are that he made, either he's a liar, he's a complete lunatic, or he is Lord. He is who he says he is. Either way, you can love him or you can hate him, but you cannot ignore him. After all, it was Jesus who made this claim, the famous John 3, 16, where he said, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not die, will not perish, actually, but they will have eternal life. It's the same as Jesus who said this, anyone who believes in God's son has eternal life. Anyone who doesn't 
experience or doesn't obey him will not experience that life. It's the very same Jesus who said in John chapter 14. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. No one comes to God. No one comes to know the Father unless they come through me. I've called an end to ritualistic religion. And I'm opening up a new way that, the God, that people can come to know God. And they cannot come to know God unless they come through me. My friends, these are audacious claims. And yet my point to you today is this. The open tune demonstrates to us, number one, that death is not the final word, that there is something beyond death. It's not as final as it seems. And number two, Jesus should be trusted. The same Jesus that said, I will be betrayed, die and rise again, is the same one who said, unless you believe in me, you're not going to live forever. Unless you believe in me, the only way you can have eternal life is by believing and trusting in me, that same Jesus who was right about his death and resurrection is right about his claim to be the only way for eternal life. And that's one of the reasons that we Christians take Jesus seriously because his claims are serious enough to consider. You know, one of the things that crisis does, you know, the world's turned upside down at the moment, is that crises, one of the good things that can come out of it, is it helps us to reassess it helps us to reevaluate our priorities, uh, both on a macro and a micro level. And certainly our governments, hope, hopefully, on a macro level, are considering and reassessing certain things as we move forward as a state, as a local government, as families. We have the chance, we have the opportunity during a crisis to reevaluate, reevaluate what really is the most important thing. Well, my friends, what could be more important? then taking the claim and the promise of eternal life seriously. What could be more important than eternal life? Many of us are concerned and thinking, what's going to happen next week? What's going to happen next month? The next six months? What will next year look like? Well, what will eternity look like? And if Jesus can be trusted, he said he would die and rise again, and he did. He said many things that took place. Then that's one of the reasons we trust him. When he said he is the only way to eternal life. Which brings us to my third point today. An open curtain, an open tomb, and thirdly, an open door. An open door. As we continue to read the story of Jesus is risen from the dead, the ladies go and see him, okay, they find out he's resurrected. One of the very next stories we see is Jesus walking along the road and he comes across a couple that actually knew him but didn't recognize him, okay? And he walks and he talks with them on the road. And after a while of him approaching them and engaging in a conversation, them experiencing the resurrection of Jesus, even though they didn't know it, this couple opened the door of their home to him. This couple say, listen, this is our house. We're going to open the door. Would you come in and have a meal with us? An open curtain an open tomb, and now an open door where a couple said, Jesus, we want to invite you in to our place. Let's be friends together. And this whole concept Jesus brings up in the very last book of our Bible. It's called the book of Revelation, where Jesus says these words. He says, listen, look, behold, the old Bible say, I stand at the door and I knock. If you would hear my voice, and if you would open the door, I will come in, and we will share a meal together as friends. I'm standing at the door, I'm knocking, if you'll open it, I'll come in, and we can share a meal together. You know, the open curtain is a historical fact of Good Friday. There's nothing you can do to change that. It happened, it's fact, it's done. The open tomb is a historical fact of Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. Nothing you can do to change that. It's done, it's done, it's done. But the open door into your life is where you come in. That is a choice that you get to make, to take Jesus' invitation to open the door of your heart and allow the resurrection, resurrected Jesus to find a place in your life. And today... One of the whole reasons we're doing this, to give you a sneak peek into a church environment, to open our doors, open our windows, open our curtain to you, 
but also to say this whole Jesus thing that multiplied millions of people around the world are celebrating today and have done for the last 2,000 years, this is no fairy tale, this is no fable. This is fact. And it comes with a decision to be made. The open curtain that ended ritualistic religion, opened access to God, the holiest of God, with the forgiveness of sins that Jesus said at the cross. An open tomb that's, that convinces us that there is life beyond this and that Jesus must be taken at his word. The question is now, will you open the door of your life and invite Jesus to come in and to participate with you in a genuine relationship? I really hope you do that today. There are three things that I want to encourage you to consider doing today. And I just call them the A, B, C's of beginning a relationship with God. The A, B, C's. I'm a bit of an acronym guy. You're just going to have to get used to this, okay? The first thing I want to encourage you to do is to acknowledge Him. A, acknowledge God today. Stop ignoring Him. Stop ignoring Him. This is a time where we evaluate what is most important. Don't ignore Him. Acknowledge Him today. Say good day. B, I want to encourage you to believe in him, to take him at his word, like I've said today. And then C, I want to encourage you to cooperate with him, to walk in a relationship with him. And one of the easiest and first ways you can do that is by saying something with your mouth. There's a verse in the Bible, Romans 10, that says this, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is who he said he was, Lord, if you believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Save from what? Well, in simple terms, save from the finality of death is one thing. Because there is a life after this. My friends, if you've never done this before, if you've never started a relationship with God, you know, I, I often say, you might say that you don't have a relationship with God. Well, God has a relationship with you. He knows who you are, but He wants in. And He wants you to invite Him into an intimacy that you can truly know and enjoy Him forever. If you'd like to begin a relationship with God today, we'd like to help you with that. And all you need to do at home is pray this prayer with me. A, B, C. Say, Jesus, I acknowledge you today. I make a decision to give you the attention you deserve. B, Jesus, I believe in you today. I believe you died for the forgiveness of my sin. I believe that you rose again, proving you have power and you are greater than death. I believe that eternal life is something that only you can guarantee. See, Jesus, I cooperate with you today. You are my Savior and you are my King. I trust you today. With my today and with all of my tomorrows. I open the door of my heart and life to your friendship. I want to know you today. Friends, this really is a good weekend. One of the stories that Easter proves to us over and over again, that God is able to bring triumph out of tragedy. Today is a good day. We remember an open curtain the end of ritualistic religion. We remember an open tomb because death does not have the final word. And today I trust that you opened your heart and opened your life to him. If you did, please understand, walking with Jesus is a journey that you don't need to do on your own. It is a faith journey. It is a friendship journey. It is a journey of increased familiarity. We'd love to help you walk through that journey. You can contact us on Facebook, email us, uh, look at us up on our website. Somehow, through technology, we'd love to help you walk through that journey because of all the uncertainty that's taking place at the moment this is something we know Jesus is risen indeed I hope you've enjoyed today's message remember to check us out at baysidechurch.org.au and of course if you're ever in the area please pop in and say good day.